<clears throat> another uh, member of the faculty from Bart's Art Center in London to speak to us on CTO Angioplasty, the European perspective. So, Elliot, Elliot, welcome to our conference and really happy to have you with us today. Thanks very much. Thanks for the invites. So I've started my screen share, just confirmed to me that you can see that and you're, you're happy. Yeah, good. it looks beautiful. Okay, good. That's just the first slide. All right. So uh, when I was chatting with Andreas, he asked me to give a talk on CTO PCI, the European perspective, obviously with you guys being over in uh, North America, it would be an interesting way of looking at the, um, uh, looking at the subject. And I suppose in thinking about this, firstly, I had to be clear, well, do I really know what the US perspective might be? I can certainly talk to you about a UK perspective uh, and we want to take a bit of a global view of where the areas of interest in this space are. But really what I wanna concentrate on today is our approaches to CTO PCI. Where are the hard indications? Where are the innovations? What have been the barriers? Uh, to performing these sorts of procedures? Where are the areas of controversy? And perhaps there is where we're going to start to contact where there might be some international perspectives. What's been the uptake based on the innovations that we discuss? And where should CTO sit within a PCI program? Well, I suppose when we're thinking of CTO, it's no different than any other patient who presents to us with a combination of symptoms, viability and ischemia, uh, and those symptoms are refractory to medical therapy. So let's say we've got a 55 year old male on three antianginals who's fairly symptomatic uh, with an impaired quality of life. They've got a good LV function. They've got a clear large area of right coronary ischemia. Uh, do we feel in any way uncomfortable about offering this patient a PCI procedure? And obviously the answer there is no, but we do start to feel different for the exactly the same procedure uh, or the exactly the same patient when the anatomy looks like this. Well, what about when it looks like this? What about the patients had previous bypass surgery uh, and has a CTO affecting that territory? Also, they've got their last remaining conduit is providing the retrograde collateralization and even that has got a high grade stenosis in it. So we're seeing a hierarchy of risk, but a very similar clinical picture. Well, we know there's an unmet need for CTO revascularization. Uh, we've known this for a long time, that if you look at a large cohort of patients who undergo invasive angiography uh, on the basis of their symptoms predominantly, you will see that up to 20% of patients have a CTO, but that it's the minority that get it offered any form of revascularization. About a quarter of patients will get a bypass, only 10% of patients will have a CTO performed. And this is not because these areas are non-viable. Most of these patients uh, do not have Q waves. Most of these patients have good left ventricular function. So there seems to be a barrier and that barrier is based on a global, not any particular location view that CTO procedures take longer with more contrast, radiation, lab time, higher cost, and of course, lower success. But from a patient perspective, well, this anatomy is stable or there's no ischemia as it's collateralized and there's enhanced risk to the patient of doing a procedure. But we also know from trials that there's a key message here that incomplete revascularization, whether you're using bypass surgery or PCI is bad. And we know that if you leave a large proportion of unrevascularized territory, the outcomes long-term are less good. We know that from syntax. What is the single major driver for incomplete revascularization in the PCI space? Well, it's the presence uh, of a CTO. We know that collateralization does not prevent ischemia. We've known that from over 15 years ago with Gerald Werner doing this excellent study where when you cross the CTO segment, you do a pressure wire study. So you replace your working wire with a pressure wire. And you see that even the largest collaterals in this more recent um, survey done by Sachdeva, that even the largest collaterals do not predominantly prevent ischemia. When you cross with a pressure wire, it will still be ischemic. And so I've spent a long time, as have colleagues in, the, in, in our space, trying to look at what our global approach is to refractory ischemia with anatomy like this. And there's no doubt that there is anatomical selection and there's a mindset that says, well, I could, but I won't. 
And we want to move into a position where we have a growth mindset of saying, well, I can't, but I should. So the next question is, well, does intervention actually improve your outcome? And perhaps one of the problems in this space has been that the randomized trials that we've had have not really uh, been all out positive for CTO. The Euro CTO study was a large randomized trial, which did show a significant symptom benefit. But the decision CTO trial, which was an Asian study, did not demonstrate any benefit at all. Now, the Euro CTO study did show clear benefits in terms of symptom benefit for patients with a PC, uh, having PCI for uh, a CTO. And that is the main driver for us doing any form of revascularization percutaneously in stable patients is symptom benefit. So there's no doubt that there was a significant symptom benefit in modestly complex patients with a high success rate, uh, but only 50, 65% of these patients had proven ischemia and the ejection fractions were universally good. What's really important is to look at the fact that 90% of patients who were screened were never entered into the trial. Why? Mainly based on physician preference that these patients were too symptomatic. So even in less symptomatic patients who have good LV function, there's no doubt that you do get a symptomatic benefit, but many patients just simply don't get into the trial. Uh, I'm not going to spend a long time on decision CTO, but it's very clear that this was a very low risk group. There was a confounding uh, impact of multi-vessel PCI. There was a very large crossover rate. It was slow recruitment. These were very small centers doing five CTOs a year on, on, or en entering five CTOs a year from some of the centers. And what it showed was that uh, it had a large amount of patients who had no symptoms at all. So CTO PCI wasn't better than optimal medical therapy for asymptomatic patients with minimal ischemia. So it didn't really move us on, but this was the message that got out to the wider interventional community and was very negative for the CTO space. Of course, set against that, with all the flaws of registry data, are that when you have patients who do undergo a procedure, the outcomes are far better if you get the artery open than if you fail. Uh, and that goes for reduction of angina, reduction of the need for repeat revascularization, and even a signal towards possible prognostic benefit. But the success rates were around 70%. And so the benefit clearly of doing a procedure is really in successful patients. And so the conclusion within the space and around the world for, patient, for people who felt that these patients needed to be treated better was that we had to get better at doing it. We had to have a systematic approach that would be successful, predictable, reproducible, teachable, efficient, and safe. And the aspiration was to do that for all indicated patients without any anatomical selection. That would be the aspiration to be able to offer patients uh, a revascularization for symptoms. Now we've seen a huge amount of innovation in technology over the last 10, 15 years in wire technology, the evolution of microcatheters and the use of dedicated re-entry devices. But really the, it's the quantum leaps in the CTO space haven't been so much uh, uh, technology-based as conceptual. And the first major step forward really coming out of Japan was the idea that you didn't have to be limited to going antigradely. You could start to use collaterals to get retrogradely uh, into the distal vessel and work backwards through the vessel. And then the second huge quantum leap was that we didn't necessarily need to stay within plaque but we could use dissection techniques. We could use the distensibility of the adventitia as a strategy for crossing longer occlusions, tracking round the, the occlusion, provided that you could then re-enter the true lumen distally or proximally, depending on which direction you work. And so that gives us four different ways to treat a CTO. We can go forwards or backwards, antegrade, retrograde. We can go intraplaque with a wire-based strategy or we can dissect around the occlusion and re-enter. So we can either go antegrade, retrograde, dissection, or intraplaque. The next key innovation was really in mindset, which is that we then struggled 
well, which is the right way to fix any particular vessel in any situation? Do I go antegrade? Do I go retrograde? When do I need to dissect? And it was the understanding that you need to integrate all of the techniques in order to be successful for any one patient. So it used to be that a patient came along, had an antegrade fail, and you bring them back for retrograde. And that gradually disappeared as we realized that in any case, we needed to be able to use all available techniques, plus or minus technologies, if we're gonna be successful. And that's where hybrid CTO, or the hybrid algorithm for CTO was born. And this was definitely a North American concept. And, you know, this goes back to the history and actual fact in Yale, because one of my main mentors in this space was Craig Thompson, who you will remember uh, when he spent his time at Yale and used to come over uh, to our center. And indeed, that's how uh, I became involved in CTO was actually largely down to the very goodwill from this collaboration, which now continues. So hybrid is an integration of techniques. It was a way of standardizing how you're going to approach any particular case, what your initial strategy is and what your initial, your provisional approach was, and really trying to concentrate on getting good procedural efficiency to make sure that we reduced radiation and contrast, all of those things that prevent us from taking on procedures to enhance patient comfort, and of course, not compromise cath lab workflow. One of the key concepts of this is to understand that you need to switch early from a failing strategy. And if during a PCI procedure, I am unsuccessful, I wanna be unsuccessful as soon as possible because then I can switch to a more successful strategy. But that presupposes that you've had the necessary training and education and that you have the available technologies to make that change. And that will depend on your level of experience. But only by doing that can you make sure that you do not use excessive time, radiation and contrast because you're not stuck in a failure mode. And there's no difference in that if I'm talking to your fellows to how your approach is to intubating the right coronary artery when you're first learning to cath. You don't want to be trying the same thing 10, 15 times. If it's failed two or three times, it's probably time to change strategy. So how does hybrid CTO work? Well, when you're looking at an angiogram of a patient with CTO, you ask four important questions. That requires dual catheter angiography. The decision to do the procedure should be based on clinical reasons, symptoms, viability, and ischemia. How you're going to do the procedure depends on the anatomy. And those four questions are firstly, what is the nature of the proximal cap? Is it clear or unambiguous? An ambiguous cap means we don't really know where the vessel continues after the occlusion. And so we're not sure if we penetrate with a stiff wire, whether we'll be in a vessel structure or architecture, as we say, or whether we're gonna be outside the vessel. So is it clear or ambiguous? What's the lesion length? Longer lesion lengths tend to require dissection, shorter, will you often be able to be uh, performed with wire-based approaches. What's the nature of the distal landing zone? Is there a major bifurcation at the distal cap or close to the distal cap? Because if there is, you're not going to want to use a dissection technique and dissect past it. What's the amount of disease in that distal landing zone? Is it going to be suitable for re-entry? And finally, what is, fourth question, what are the quality of the collaterals? Are these collaterals just best used for visualization or can we use these to deliver kit retrogradely in order to facilitate getting the artery fixed? So here's a case illustration. And this is a classical case of someone who has a diffusely diseased distal right coronary and a completely ambiguous proximal cap. Here's a, um, uh, here's uh, the proximal cap shot of the right coronary artery. I can't tell you whether the vessel continues here, continues here. Does it go somewhere between? I'm not entirely certain. Meanwhile, although they don't project well here, there are septal connections into the distal vessel. So there are potential interventional collaterals. So proximal cap's ambiguous, lesion length is long, landing zone is good, interventional collaterals, yes. So this is most likely going to require retrograde because of the ambiguity, but it's got interventional collaterals, it's long, so we're going to likely need to dissect. So the primary approach is likely to be, or the successful approach is likely to be retrograde dissection and re-entry. And indeed, this is real-time wiring of a septal collateral, delivery of a microcatheter. You'll note here that 
that I don't spend time wiring up through this lesion, what I do is I push a polymeric wire up to the proximal cap. It's an unusual uh, appearance if you're not used to CTO, but now we've defined the width of the adventitia. We can now see that that ambiguity is gone. We know exactly where that proximal cap is. It was from the more lateral uh, aspect of this vessel. And we can now puncture onto that proximal cap, dilate antegradely, wire retrogradely, externalize and complete the case. And so this is a retrograde dissection re entry case. I would say that we start with a feel with a soft polymeric wire antegradely first, but we're not expecting that to work. So if it doesn't work, we switch quick. The antegrade dissection re-entry concept has always been the slightly more uh, controversial area. But the bottom line is that some cases you cannot wire and some cases have no retrograde options. And that's where we use antegrade dissection and re-entry. And this is where we dissect around the lesion. And we can use dedicated re-entry technologies such as crossbot and stingray to re-enter. When do we do ADR? Well, we do ADR where we've got a clear cap, where we've got a long lesion. We've got a distal landing zone that has no bifurcation and it's free of significant disease. So we're not going to compromise outflow into any branches. But don't forget, we can use this as a secondary approach if we're failing to antegrade wire and we find our wire is subintimal. Or indeed, if we cannot get retrograde in a case that we thought would be better for a retrograde approach. Here's such an example. This is one where I thought it's diffusely diseased distally. There's a bit of proximal cap ambiguity. It's not actually that long, but it's just around 20 millimeters. And there weren't interventional collaterals. There are very epicardial, tortuous, dangerous looking collaterals, which would have a high risk of failure or perforation. So working antegradely, I wasn't able to wire this. So what we do is knuckle around the calcium. We dissect around the calcium. Then we bring the crossboss catheter down. This is a blunt dissecting technology. And you can see it crossing from on top of the lesion to underneath the lesion, creating a small dissection plane. This sort of technique is completely alien. We had to use new ways of traversing lesions that we're not used to with this rapid rotation. And we learned about knuckling. We relearned how we use wires. We folded over polymeric jacketed wires to create dissection planes so that we could get into the distal uh, past uh, calcific areas and, and into the distal vessel and negotiate tortuosity without wire exit. Now there are actually dedicated engineered knuckle wires. This is the formation of a knuckle and it looks completely new and quite bizarre when you first start doing it. But here, this is a very safe thing to do. You're tracking around the calcium. If you look at this in two views, you can see the line of calcium and that the knuckle is within vessel architecture. So it's blunt dissection, pressures force over area. If we take a very stiff wire, it may penetrate, but a knuckled wire will dissect around. And then of course, you've already seen uh, the dissection with the crossboss catheter. Then we introduce the stingray catheter, which is uh, a specialist balloon. It's basically an over the wire balloon with two exit ports that are offset at 180 degrees. So that when you orientate it correctly, one is pointing towards vessel lumen, one towards van ventitia. You take a stiff wire and penetrate like a sort of transeptal puncture or um, a radial puncture, if you like, you're trying to pop back into the true lumen. And then we often replace that wire with a polymeric wire to drive into the distal vessel. And then we replace that catheter um, balloons and stents. And your final outflow result has to have outflow into all major branches. And in the UK and across hybrid registries, we probably use antegrade dissection re-entry about 15 to 20% of the time. This is a few years old, this data, we were using a little bit more. Nowadays, things have iterated a little bit more, but probably 15 to 20% of the time, 30% of the time you tend to go retrograde, 50% of the time you'll be antegrade wiring. The need to use dissection goes up as your JCTO score, which is a so uh, a score of anatomical complexity goes up. So longer lesions, more calcification, more tortuosity, a blunt cap or a prior failure will reduce the likelihood with which you're going to be using a wire-based technique. And whether you're going antegrade or retrograde, it will increase the likelihood that you're going to need a dissection technique. But dissection seems to cause worry. 
Now, what do we worry about as CT operators? Well, we worry about the same things that all operators think about, even our surgical colleagues think about, everyone worries about. We want to have procedural success. We want to limit complications and we want to have good long-term outcome and durability. But there's been a lot of backlash against dissection specifically. Is it traumatic? Is it disruptive? And these words are commonly used in connection with dissection and reentry techniques. And it's worth challenging it because what we're saying is that blunt dissecting around the lesion may be traumatic to the vessel. Well, we're all PCI doctors. And do we think that inflating a balloon in calcific severe stenosis to above 20 atmospheres or 40 atmosphere is in any way calming or soothing for the vessel? We are all disruptors of vessel anatomy when we're doing PCI. And after all, 20 atmospheres, well, that's 300 PSI. That is 20 car tires worth of, uh, or 10 car tires worth of pressure. It's traumatic. So if you think you're being traumatic doing CTO, maybe PCI in general is not the right thing for you. What are the outcomes when we use these types of approaches? Well, nowadays there are large registries using hybrid approaches, both in Europe with recharge, uh, consistent in the UK, and then also open CTO and progress CTO in the US that are getting 90% success. So we're seeing Europe and the USA uh, um, aligned here with the hybrid approach, trained operators using the same sort of algorithm with high anatomical complexity and patient complexity that wasn't getting into those studies that we spoke about. And we're seeing 90% success, so still not 100% successful, but in those patients who are successful, improved angina, improved quality of life, low MACE, low TVR rates, and importantly, vessel healing. I'm gonna come back to vessel healing in a moment. So when we're considering a CTO patient, what's the potential benefit? Well, we can look at them like any patient. Have they got typical symptoms? And how much viability and ischemia do they have? And, you know, if you've got a patient who's got a CTO with typical symptoms and they've got significant viability and ischemia, you're just going to do it. When you've got patients who have got uh, areas where they've got atypical symptoms, but a lot of ischemia, you'll give them the benefit of the doubt and you'll have a discussion about managing their expectations. If they've got classical symptoms, but you can't demonstrate that much ischemia, again, it's a more difficult discussion, but you're likely to offer it. The key is that what we do not want to do is offer CTO PCI because of the risks and the small failure rate to patients who have absent or atypical symptoms with no evidence of viability or ischemia. So do our trials expand the indications? Well, on this uh, plot, this is where I'd stick the EuroCTO study. So modestly um, uh, ischemic patients, we can't really quantify, who predominantly have symptoms, but a lot of the most symptomatic I told you were excluded. Decision CTO is barely on the chart. All of the studies that I've shown you in hybrid sit well into this upper quadrant with patients who are clearly selected with significant ischemia and typical symptoms. And we can talk about the ischemia study perhaps in the discussion. What about healing? Well, we set out to answer that question uh, in the consistent CTO study. This was a UK study. We were one of the six, value, uh, six high volume centers. A lot of patients, 210 out of 231 successful. And we looked at those successful cases and we did an IVUS before we implanted stents, OCT at 12 months, more OCT than has ever been done in any PCI study and clinical follow-up out to two years. These are complex patients, high JCTO scores, long lesions, mean stent length uh, above eight centimeters. The first thing to say is that we did roughly half patients with a dissection strategy and half the patients with a wire-based strategy. And we wanted to look at healing and the differences in healing. Because we either adjudicated the strategy, the first thing I can tell you is that there is discordance. There is discordance between our strategy and the actual anatomy. What do I mean by that? What I mean is that for those people who say, well, you have to stay within plaque. If you antigradely wire, about 12% of the time, you will be subintimal over segments anyway. 
If you try and retrogradely wire, if you believe that you've gone inverted commas true to true and you haven't either adjudicated, you will be outside what was the true lumen 25% of the time, more than 25% of the time. And the converse is true, that when you're using a dissection strategy, you may actually be within plaque. So the first thing to say is that if you're a believer that you should never be outside the true lumen or outside the plaque, you're already doing it. If you're a CTO operator, maybe CTO isn't for you. Well, what about healing in dissection versus non-dissection cases once you've either adjudicated? Well, we are slightly comparing uh, apples and oranges here. They're a different group. I've already told you that you're going to have uh, more complex patients requiring dissection techniques. I've already explained that. But what is key here is that although they are more complex cases with higher JCTO scores, you can see 22% had prior bypass versus 11%. You'll tend to dissect more. Uh, there's a longer length of stent, almost 10 centimeters of stent in dissected patients. There's still seven and a half centimeters of stent in the um, uh, wire-based strategies, the key was that there was no difference in vessel healing at all, whether you're subintimal or whether you're in plaque. No significant excess of aneurysms, and at the re-entry zones, we saw vessel healing. This is a lot of stent struts that were looked at. And how did patients do clinically? Well, there was no significant impact of dissection versus no dissection. What determines your long-term outcome are the usual issues such as uh, diabetes um, and uh, other markers of complexity. So yes, the outcomes may not be as good in the longest lesions who have diabetes, but even then those outcomes are commensurate or better than large registries of complex patients who are, have non-CTO procedures. So there's no real uh, reason nowadays to suggest that a patient shouldn't have a procedure done on the basis that they may have dissection. Now, is there a geographical divide? Well, uh, we can look at this in two ways. I think there is some merging of mindsets now. There's no doubt that I would be of the mindset that says dissection and reentry techniques are a key enabler to facilitate success, but even the most um, negative uh, views that have previously existed would still admit that dissection reentry is definitely available and can be used at the very least as a last resort when success can't otherwise be achieved. There are technologies that are helping us to challenge our own perceptions in this space. How can a simple technology do that? Well, here's a new uh, over the dual over the wire mic. Catheter. So this is a dual lumen microcatheter, but it's got two over the wire uh, ports instead of one. And it's got three exit ports, a distal port, a proximal port, and a more proximal port than that. And it's similar in concept to what I've shown you with Stingray because the ports are offset by 180 degrees, such that you've got 365 degree access to different parts of the vessel because you can rotate it and use it as a standard microcatheter. How are we merging the spaces with this? Well, this recross design, we've always used dual lumen microcatheters in the CTO space to facilitate a proximal cap puncture uh, to use the support that you get. But what's more interesting is whether you can use it for plaque redirection, so parallel wiring as it used to be called, or whether you can use it for dissection and reentry. So let's have a look at this case. This is a previous failed CTO. It looks quite short, but in actual fact, I'll tell you that the proximal cap is much more proximal than we thought. And this is a septal set of branches. So the proximal caps up here and the distal landing zone is down there. And the previous failure mode was that the operator was subintimal and caused uh, an enhanced dissection. So we use the microcatheter to get to the proximal cap. And then we use the side port to penetrate the proximal cap. And then we bring the microcatheter into the proximal cap on that penetrated wire. And I've used an anchoring balloon technique in the septal branch to try and get through. And I've got a gladius wire, which is a polymeric wire, which is tracking around the vessel, but not in true lumen. So I now can see with a retrograde visualization that we're adjacent to the true lumen, but not in it. Now I can use the side ports 
to try and redirect back into the true lumen. So here you see me exiting the side port with a stiff penetrative wire. This is a Gaia wire, a, uh, an Asahi wire. And you can see that there is separation, a push, a pop and release. And we are in the true lumen. Here we confirm true lumen position with a retrograde injection, uh, which you can see now. And then we go on to complete the case. So was this anti-grade dissection? Was this parallel wiring? Perhaps you can only define that after you do the IVUS and you see that we are definitely true lumen proximally. We are definitely subintimal in the mid vessel. We're definitely back into true lumen at the re-entry point where this calcium is. And we can definitely see that we're true lumen distally. And where there was an area of dissection, there's even a small amount of subintimal hematoma here. What makes this dissection or re-entry? What makes this parallel wiring? Well, what it is, is that if I accept that my wire was in the wrong position adjacent to the lumen, then I'll bring my re-entry technology all the way down to the distal landing zone and I'll re-enter there. If I'm a parallel wirer, I may want to try and stay within the true lumen by having the microcatheter further back and working through the vessel to find another channel but I've already proven to you that it doesn't matter as long as you have outflow. And it's this sort of technology and this sort of IVUS examination that is teaching us all about how we should be approaching our CTOs. So for the last few minutes, uh, let's talk about whether these technologies and advances are influencing uptake. This was an interesting paper that was put together from the UK data set by my friend and colleague, Tim Kinnaird, who used to be a colleague in London and is now a consultant in Cardiff. And Tim looked at how much uptake there was. Uh, granted, it's a few years out of date now, but it's only recently been published. And it showed that there was more success the more enabling technologies you use. So if you're a user in a CTO of a penetrative catheter, dual access, a cross boss, other microcatheters, you tend to, and the use of IVUS, you will have more success. So that sounds like it's more complexity gets more success. But what it probably is, is a marker of those people that are starting to build CTO programs. But overall, the attempt rate has not been increasing. And the overall success rate, at least to 2015, remains disappointingly low, still around the 70% rate. So where is the innovation needed? Well, perhaps it's not in technology, but it is in our mindset. It's about having skill sets and not specific technologies and how we're going to use them and how we're going to train up. Now, I've shown you some uh, use of an algorithm based approach to approach CTOs, but just showing you an algorithm doesn't necessarily translate into practice. This is a fairly um, classical view of an algorithm, but everyone who's watching this knows the algorithm for this bit of technology, right? You know where to find it, it's under your seat. You might not remember because we've not been able to go on one of the large vehicles that uh, usually has this technology in it for a while, but you know where your life jacket is, it's under your seat, you know the algorithm, you put it on over your head, you tie it in a double bow at the side. It's got a light for attracting uh, attention and also a whistle uh, and you mustn't inflate it until you get outside of the plane. So everyone knows that. So I'd like you to now just examine this picture. So the answer that you're looking for is two. There are two people wearing life jackets on this emergency landing on water. This is the Miracle and the Hudson, and it is an amazing success story. But I put it to you, would it have been a success story if it hadn't happened on the Hudson where we could get help very, very rapidly to those people who were standing in potentially uh, freezing water. Um, so even when we're shown what to do and we've heard what to do, until you start to do it, it's very difficult to make any impact. How do you do it with CTO? Well, it's a stepwise approach. Basic interventional skills, looking at the angiograms, developing your anti-grade skill set, developing a retrograde skill set, then starting to look at dissection re-entry and then putting it all together. And that requires training, it requires 
dedication to set up a program and it is going to require proctoring and even after that it's going to require uh, a lot of coming together to help iterate the space together but it will have a huge impact on your non-CTO practice because doing CTO gives you a really improved anatomical understanding it makes you you analyze angiograms forensically. It makes you think more about radiation and contrast, and it's incredible for advanced team working. And the techniques that we use are becoming ubiquitous and used in non-CTO complex case. The use of advanced guide extension techniques, anchor balloons, advanced wire microcatheters, wire trapping techniques, how we deal with dissections and understanding not to give anti-grade injections and which wires work well. And of course, avoiding and treating perforations and complications. And if you're a CTO center that has a CTO program, it will enhance all of the other programs that you have for LV support, post-CABG, advanced imaging, calcium modification, how we treat left mains and bifurcations. And by doing that, we expand the opportunities for meeting the unmet need of a larger population. And wherever you've got volume, um, volume, will only follow quality. But if you're going to do this, you're going to need to deal with failure. I fail more often than anyone else in my institution, and you have to deal with that. But you also have to recognize that failure isn't the opposite of success. It's part of it. And you have to create systems and cultures that allow us to learn from our errors and shout about what's gone wrong rather than being threatened by it. And of course, uh, I think this is actually a first lady quote. I think it's one of your first ladies said, you can't learn from the mistakes of, uh, you, you have to learn from the mistakes of others. You can't make them all yourself. And so it is about being collegiate. But it comes back to this, that what is the global uh, separation between approaches, North America, particularly Japan, Europe, UK, these are becoming less and less as we see things like this consensus document from Manos Perlakis, which I was very pleased to be involved with as well, setting out guiding principles for chronic total occlusion. What are they? Well, firstly, we're doing it for symptoms. You've got to select the patients right. If we're going to do it, you've got to have dual catheter angiography to get it correct. You've got to use a microcatheter. You need to combine all of the available techniques and strategies, and you need to know that you need to switch from a failing strategy, which presupposes that you are adequately trained in the additional techniques. That includes getting teaching, getting training, and getting proctoring. And then finally, that it's not just good enough to now fix the artery once we've crossed, you really need to use intravascular imaging to enhance the long-term results and optimize your result for the future. So I'm gonna end there by saying, there are differences in approaches to CTO, but I would put it to you that they are more philosophical than geographical, that hybrid CTO has really enhanced uptake and success. And that really started in the USA and the UK, but has spread throughout Europe and definitely does have penetration into those strongholds of being plaque based in Japan uh, and across Asia. If you want to be successful in these sorts of procedures, you have to train in all the available techniques and technologies and you have to integrate them together. And that involves engaging a specialist team, sharing your experiences and very importantly, being open to and embracing failure. So on that note, I'm going to stop and we'll be delighted to discuss and take questions. Elliot, thank you very much. That was a You're great... not gonna tell me I was on mute for the whole thing, were you? No, no it was a great discussion. Make up your own words. <laughs> it was great. I just have a couple of questions. So uh, can you comment on your use or integration of coronary CT in your CTO practice. So we found very often somebody wants you to consider doing a CTO intervention on, you know, a, a cath angiogram, which may or may not be totally helpful in terms of planning. And um, we've kind of gravitated more and more to uh, coronary CT. Have you used that uh, in your practice at the UK? Yeah, absolutely. It's a really hugely important tool. 
uh, and not necessarily always in the most obvious ways that you might think. So people are very excited about co-registration and using mapping in the same way that REP colleagues do. And we've done a very little bit of that, but actually co-registration and mapping can be very difficult because of the amount of movement that there is uh, and that you've got a diastolic um, data set. But even that has been quite interesting. But much more importantly, in terms of procedural planning, CT has been invaluable, especially in post bypass patients for looking at anatomical ambiguity, telling us where old grafts inserted so that we could use them. And then about the CTO themselves, we did a fantastic case. The one that Andreas was just speaking about was a live recorded case that we did for PCR, where this patient had a completely ambiguous osteal LAD occlusion, proximal cap occlusion, and virtually no retrograde filling very distal LAD. We got him a CT to see whether he could have any form of revascularization, and it showed a huge LAD. It showed me that it was a non-calcific uh, proximal cap. It showed me that it actually was a short occlusion. And on that basis, according to patient preference, he was offered a PCI because we knew that there was an LAD there, even though we couldn't see it. So it, it's hugely valuable for procedural planning. And what's the, uh, one of the barriers here in the US is that um, there's a payer resistance to coronary CT for people who've already had a, a coronary angiogram, for example. Do you have any uh, barriers to utilizations of coronary CT in your practice there at Bart's? Uh, not so much, but because coronary CT is a part of our algorithm for investigation of all chest pain patients. So it's the preferred modality, um, usually used as a rule out rather than a rule in. But once it rules in, we're so used to it, uh, it's not an issue. Also, there's been some excellent work done by Dan Jones, one of my colleagues alongside Anthony, looking in the post bypass patients and now CT is going to become part of our program almost certainly based on those results that every post bypass patient before they ever have a cath will have a CT and that reduces or should reduce I don't want to um, second guess his outcomes but it, it's going to reduce uh, radiation it's going to reduce contrast um, and it's going to make for safer angiography yeah. so pretty much all my CT, all my post-grafts patients, if they're not presenting acutely, the vast majority will get a CT to help procedural planning and to reduce the need for, um, you know, uh, too much contrast. Okay, great, thank you. I don't know if you can see the chat. There's a question in there about how often do you proceed with ad hoc CTO versus- uh, really, uh, That is never, uh, even, e e even the most simple, uh, CTOs that you think are going to wire straightforward. They have to be set up with dual catheters because 10% of the time you won't be able to wire it and you'll need another technique. Uh, also, every single CTO goes through an MDT, every single one, because at the start of the service, we knew that it cost more to use more equipment and we wanted to make sure that indications were cast iron. I was extremely frustrated by that. Why are you second guessing my practice? These years later, it's the best thing in the world. There is no patient who ever goes on my table where there is no, you know, there may have been a debate about whether we should do it beforehand, but at the point at which they hit the table, the whole group has come to a consensus that it is reasonable and safe to offer this procedure. And that is a huge benefit. So I would never carry straight on. Great, thank you. Elliot, it's Alexandra. Um, can you just speak a little bit about training and what your recommendations would be there? It sounds like you had a lot of training with Craig. The question is, you know, is this, do you think, you know, it should be sort of a, an advanced fellowship dedicated year? Or is it something that you can train up as a faculty member during your, your um, practice? Uh, I think you can do it as both. For the latter, there'd have to be institutional buy-in because you're going to need to spend time with upper. Uh, you know, if you're if you're being appointed as an attending, and then there is a desire to then get into CTO, you've got to do that as a local group saying, yeah, you know, we're supporting new our new colleague to get involved with this. 
and support them to go to the relevant meetings, get proctoring, etc. I think we're now moving into a phase where, because that's exactly as you say, um, that's exactly how I trained was with Craig and we were sort of finding our way as we went. Now we've got much more mature algorithms. We've got a, a more defined skill set. So I think as a senior fellow, I see this now as a fellowship opportunity for senior trainees before the attending level to get a significant amount of exposure to, if not complete proficiency in these techniques. And it, it, it bolts onto a CHIP fellowship or complex uh, interventional procedures fellowship. I don't think that every CHIP doctor needs to do CTO, um, but I don't think that uh, people who aren't doing calcium modification, bifurcations, uh, and other forms of complexity. I think you need to be involved in those before you're starting your CTO experience. And then my, my other question is about your MDTs. How often, do you have them once a week or several times a week? How, how do you manage those? So I was only discussing with Anthony how we structure these because of the amount of uh, multidisciplinary meetings or heart team meetings that we have now that we have to fit into our schedule. Um, but we have two uh, routine MDTs per week. Those are unselected coronary cases where we're largely defining uh, should we treat it and should it be bypass surgery or PCI. So that's the routine stuff. And some uh, many of these patients will come through that. In addition, we have a complex revascularization meeting as well, where we take more difficult decision making uh, cases, uh, plan strategies and work out not only whether we should do it, but also how we should do it. Uh, and those take place usually once a week. So you've got three opportunities a week where you can be talking about these sorts of cases. We also join with another center for some of those complex meetings and indeed now have a joint working program with a sister center on the other side of London where we take on the most complex cases because it's never nice being an outlier. So for me, you know, who's been in this for a while, I've got two or three other consultants who do CTO as well locally, but by going to another expert and we work together, we can continue to build our skill sets as well. 